to be an open year for the world, get it? Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, the top 10 open world games of 2019. Number 10 is Atomic Heart, a wildly inventive looking game that looks equal parts Bioshock, Fallout, and hey, let's exist in the Soviet Union. In fact, the story takes place specifically in an alternate history Soviet Union in which technological revolutions have already taken place. The open world this exists in appears to look nothing like anything else on the market, and that alone should be enough, I think, to get anybody interested in this game. But the idea of an exaggerated weirdness based on the real-life secrecy of the actual scientific juggernaut that was inside the Soviet Union, I think makes for historical fiction that is possibly more interesting than anything else we've looked at that could somehow be placed in a similar category. It's a world that could not only say something about the past, but perhaps our own future. Very rarely has material made about the Soviet Union not also said something about the world as it is outside the Soviet Union. But one that is critical of the internal, even in an exaggerated way, I think can and will probably lead to a very interesting narrative that makes for a very incredible grossing and different world that I cannot wait to wander around in. Atomic Heart is coming to Windows, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4 sometime this year. Number nine is The Division 2, which Ubisoft has said, quote, We've made the open world in Division 2 so alive. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say that's definitely marketing, but it's also a claim that when the game comes out, we can say is either true or false, and that's important. Ubisoft went on to say both enemy factions and the civilians will be out targeting different tactical locations, resources, acting on needs and goals. They really want to focus on making the open world feel kind of like a war zone rather than a place where you do objectives. Of course, that means a more unpredictable aspect to the way things work. And they said, running around the city is really interesting because you don't know what's going to happen around the next corner and your actions helping the civilians in the world you'll see translate into them becoming more capable, but also their homes will become little fortresses. And I think that stuff sounds pretty cool. Honestly, if your actions actually have an effect on the world in this way, and the world just constantly seems to be happening around you like, you know, the world is, I think The Division 2 could really build on the original into something that we all actually care about a lot more and that would be very good. Number eight is Far Cry New Dawn, the first actual narrative sequel in the Far Cry universe, and a very interesting piece of work because, among other things, it is using a modified map of Hope County. Of course, it will be severely modified as it is post-nuclear apocalypse, which to me is quite an interesting prospect. We haven't really experienced the difference between pre- and post-nuclear apocalypse in the same location in any game. Fallout kinda gave us that a little with Fallout 4's intro, but I think this is along the lines of the Far Cry tradition. Using the same map for Far Cry Primal the way that they did, I think kind of translates to this, except for obviously this is going into the future. There's another thing they're doing in this game, which is expedition missions which take place in different places in the country, meaning you're not going to be in Hope County the entire game, but it seems like these will probably play out as mini open worlds that you can go to and do other things, which I think sounds incredibly good. I am really enjoying that idea. Number seven is Rage 2, which is very interesting on account. The developers have said it's going to be a lot more open world than the original Rage, which is an open world game. It is, however, developed not like an open world game. It's a very linear game that doesn't really take advantage of the open world in the way that it could. I mean, in a lot of ways, it is a quality game, but just never went far enough in any direction, I think. Which is funny, because the open world in the game is primarily about travel around. Avalanche is developing this sequel, so I think we all know exactly how that turns out. They're a very good developer when it comes to open world. They are phenomenal at building sandboxes and setting you free in them with lots of tools to cause havoc, and it looks very much like Rage 2 is going to be a lot like that. Number six is Days Gone, which actually looks to separate itself pretty significantly. It doesn't want to dizzy you with an absolute ton of side quests and activities, instead giving you gameplay loops and things that you can just engage in, but keeping the actual narrative basically on a single path. They've also given you a motorcycle, which they've promised is a big part of the game. And by that, I mean, you're going to have to take care of it. You're going to have to park it, hide it, save it, and you can't like whistle to have the horse just come towards you. Wherever the bike is, that's where it is. You run out of fuel, 
You're gonna need to get some fuel and bring it back. It's not messing around. And neither are the hordes. The hordes literally just exist on the game map. And when you see a horde, you will have to deal with them in a lot of different ways. They aren't like scripted encounters. They just are on the open world, meaning you'll be dealing with the open world in a lot of variable ways. And that sounds really cool because these encounters look amazing. And obviously there will be scripted ones, but to have them just kind of possible at any time is going to give a nice feel to the world. Also, no loading screens, so that's good. Number five is Anthem, which is boasting a quote unquote, completely seamless open world. Now, they're certainly not the first to do it, but BioWare is going to be loading and unloading stuff just on a constant basis, so you can continually travel in any direction and never see a load screen. That's of course a very good thing, but what's cool to hear is they're talking about how this open world will gradually expand over time. Also, you'll see things like these storms they've talked about called shaper storms, which are supposedly world altering. So I have a feeling some of the stuff we've seen in say the Fortnite seasons that just utterly changes the world itself is something we might also be seeing in Anthem, albeit with a completely different style of gameplay. I think that's very cool. I have pretty high hopes for this, actually. I acknowledge it may be electronic arts, but I mean, if it's not, that would be great. Number four is Crackdown 3, which is actually coming out, which is astounding. However, the thing that we have to talk about is the open world. One of the big things this game has been touted for is the cloud destruction elements, which exist only in the multiplayer world. The single player world is about saving the city, and they thought, eh, it might not be great to have the entire thing fully destructible. But keeping that in mind, when you're playing in multiplayer, it's a big world that you can destroy all of. And that's it. That's the full reason to buy the game. I'm sure the single player campaign is going to be great. I'm going to play it. I'll go through the whole thing. There's no reason not to. It seems like it's going to be a good campaign, but I want to level a city too. I think both approaches are probably relevant to their specific mode, and I'm very interested in both, but I'm really interested in destroying a city. Number three is Dying Light 2, which the open world is meant to really be part of the gameplay in a way that I think a lot of open worlds look at it as a location. We talked kind of about what a sort of unfolding world might be like when we were talking about Division 2, but Dying Light 2 has really set out a specific vision for what that might look like. The idea is to have an adaptive narrative where all of the things that you do completely change what factions, people, groups, locations, how everything is in the game. You could blow something up and it would just change how a society works, for instance. The idea is to make an open world with consequences, which is, in my opinion, a very interesting idea. Again, if they can deliver on it, like I said with The Division 2, if they can deliver on it is a big deal. Simply saying the world is very interactive doesn't mean it is, and this is all obviously marketing for these games, but I mean, if you look at what we've seen of Dying Light 2, it is very cool looking. The first one's great, and what they've said of the second one sounds pretty good. Number two is The Outer Worlds, which Obsidian has been comparing to Knights of the Old Republic 2, and saying that technically it's not an open world game because there's two big planets. They both kind of exist in their own maps, but they technically work out like an open world, and if we're thinking about it, it's probably going to be a lot bigger, both of them, than a lot of traditional open world titles were as they were developing the genre. But it's interesting to see the kind of insight they're giving. They've also talked about how their intent is to make it very New Vegas style as far as exploration and interaction with the locals. This is honestly kind of my big game that I'm really looking forward to. So to see them kind of combine the aesthetics of Bioshock and Fallout, put it in space and talk about Knights of the Old Republic, they're kind of specifically like, hey, Falcon, this is something you want to play, isn't it? We know. And number one is, of course, Cyberpunk 2077, what looks to be the biggest open world game possibly at all. Like, for, like, in terms of attention it will get, it may be the one that gets all of the attention forever because they've taken a very condensed vertical approach to the open world. They're giving you as much as they can in the space that they are giving you, and that is very uh, encouraging in my opinion. Really, I don't care how big 
like physically an open world is. I care how good it is. And if that's the approach they're taking, there's a much better chance of it being good, to be frank. Got a couple of bonus games for you as well. Generation Zero coming to us from Avalanche Studios, ensuring it will be at least something interesting, is a game that takes place in 1980 Sweden, already ensuring that it is an open world filled with stuff that frankly just seems completely different. The 1980s was quite a decade and Sweden is quite a different place to be frank. But it's populated by machines and has been abandoned by the population. So as you might be able to expect we're talking about a game in which the object is a guerrilla war against machines. It sounds great as it's open world and four player co-op and very unique looking. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice which is not technically an open world game, but it will feature a massive world that's interconnected, according to From Software, in the same way Dark Souls 1 is, so kind of like a Metroidvania, so kind of a path world, so to speak. They're also designing their maps very vertically oriented so that you can take advantage of that grappling hook. Skull and Bones, which is an open sea game, I guess. It's based on the naval segments in the Assassin's Creed games. How can you really go wrong with that? Those segments are wonderful. Except it takes place in an open world. You can go anywhere, do anything. Judgment, which is a game that takes place in the world of Yakuza. In fact, directly in the same open world, same area. Uh, it's a different kind of story, though. You play as an investigator. You're on the other side of the law, so to speak. And finally, Biomutant, which is kind of a mascot platformer hack and slash action RPG. Apparently six square miles of area to explore in this game. If it is as detailed as we've seen so far, that's probably going to be a pretty dense world, and I'm very interested in that. And Metro Exodus is not technically a full-blown open world game it's kind of a semi open world game but the scale of this game is massive it will take place in a number of areas that are open world however it will also contain linear areas and in all honesty that mirrors real life in some ways if done correctly now that's really the key and we shall see but the previous two metro games are phenomenal and we really don't have any reason to believe it won't be executed well metro exodus is coming february 15th to PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Microsoft Windows.